Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Brendan. Can I acknowledge uh, you and, uh, and uh, everyone from uh, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia uh, to the uh, Australian Canadian Economic Leadership Forum uh, members, particularly our guests who have travelled here from Canada. It is uh, terrific to see you here and to cement that already very strong relationship that we have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, I suppose I've just come out of a cabinet meeting this morning, so I'm sure this has been a topic of conversation. But can I congratulate, first of all, Canada on both ice hockey gold medals? Fantastic <laughs> effort. Well done. Well done. Uh, that is uh, some achievement. I think uh, in the interests of, uh, of uh, brotherhood, you might be want to send a couple of them over to our medal tally, because I don't think we managed any gold at all this time around. Uh, I've, um, I went to, I travelled to Canada when I was working with the then Federal Treasurer of Australia, Peter Costello, and we attended a, a G20 finance minister's meeting. And this all came back to me last week because I was up in Sydney for the G20 finance minister's that was hosted in, in Australia. And uh, it was my first visit to Canada and um, I was just struck by how uh, pleasant and polite people were. And it was funny because this was directly after the Seattle World Trade Organisation riots. And I can say the Canadian rioters had such a better standard and there was a lot of quality about them. <laughs> and they were far more polite. Um, and I'm quite serious about it. It was not, not nearly the same level of disruption, but it was a, it was a, a terrific experience for me. And I, I managed to get back to Canada and to Ottawa for another conference a few years down the track. And I was uh, discussing this with, uh, with a, a friend of mine, uh, well, someone who became a friend of mine, and uh, he was from Canada. He said, oh, have you been to Canada? I said, yes, I've been there twice. I've been to Ottawa. And he said, well, that's like me saying that I've been to Australia because I've been to Canberra. Um, now, no, no slight on anyone from Ottawa or all from Canberra, but of course, uh, it is great to have you here in Melbourne, which we regard as one of the, uh, certainly one of the great cities of Australia and, and, and beyond those shores. Um, and I, when I was at, at, at the uh, G20 meeting in Sydney on the weekend, the, a lot of the discussion was about infrastructure. And I think it's just so timely that we're having this discussion now because it is a discussion that is happening in governments, around cabinet tables, in parliaments and around boardrooms and in fact around kitchen tables all over the world. The need to work out better ways to finance the infrastructure needs of, of growing economies and growing societies. And, uh, and I think there was some, some progress made in Sydney on the weekend, but I think that when you look at some of the issues that were discussed, there's no doubt that Australia and Canada are leading the pack when it comes to innovative ways to get infrastructure financed and in, in, indeed, and this is important, public acceptance for those innovative ways. Um, speaking to some of the delegates in Sydney there from other countries, there was uh, a strong sense of nervousness about the capacity for their, their public, their voters, to accept the role of private financing in public infrastructure. Now I think that is a hurdle that uh, our two countries have has successfully overcome. I would never say that it's a war that's won because you always need to keep making that case as to why that, that discipline of private sector operation and management and that uh, risk spreading and risk allocation that you get through a successful PPP is something which actually benefits the public. But certainly I think that uh, through practical examples we've been able to demonstrate to our respective communities that a successful PPP is one which brings you infrastructure that you wouldn't have otherwise had or you would have had to wait longer for or wouldn't be as good when you got it. And I think that when we are looking at, uh, at countries where there is uh, a need for more infrastructure and pressure on politicians to increase funding for infrastructure, increase financing for infrastructure, I think being able to utilise models such as we have in our respective countries along the PPP line where it's appropriate is certainly a way in which we can get the public on board that this is a way to meet some of your needs. Uh, I was um, I was in North America last uh, late last year, I took a bit of an economic roadshow with some Victorian officials from Treasury and Finance and our Victorian Funds Management Corporation and our uh, Treasury Corp Victoria, which is our, our bond issuer. And we, uh, we went to Toronto and we met with uh, the Canadian Council on PPPs and some of the pension funds and some of the banks and, uh, and others in that space. And it did strike me that there is so much 
we have to learn from each other. I think we both both uh, jurisdictions are very uh, uh, proud of how they've been innovative, but that innovation continues, and there is so much we still need to learn. Uh, from each other. Uh, I became aware of areas that Canada has put out and, and provinces within Canada have put out to PPPs that has never been done in Australia. Um, there's also the PPP fund established by the Canadian government to encourage municipalities to look to public-private partnerships uh, as, as uh, real models or real opportunities for getting infrastructure built. And I think that's certainly something which does bear examination and does bear support here in Australia. Uh, I, as a, speaking as a state treasurer, I can tell you that uh, financial support from Canberra is something which never goes uh, uh, unremarked and can be a great uh, creator of incentives. And if you look at what Australia did in the 1990s with competition policy and the sort of microeconomic reform we achieved in areas that had been under the regulatory control of the states through the use of competition payments. I think that is a very good model for how we could see uh, a greater innovation in, in use of PPPs right across the country. Uh, the theory behind uh, the use of competition payments was that uh, if, if some of these areas that had been very highly regulated were open to competition, there would be a net increase in economic growth there would be a positive revenue effect for the Commonwealth and therefore it's only fair that that positive revenue outcome arising from the economic growth should be shared with the states as the jurisdictions who actually had to do the heavy lifting to get those reforms to come about. Now I do think that there is something in that, in that model, and it is a model I would like to see the federal government uh, consider. I'm certainly happy to raise that with, uh, with my counterpart uh, Mr. Hockey, uh, when the time comes. Uh, so I think there are some things that are working very well in Canada that we can certainly look to. Uh, here in, in Victoria, we've got a, a very proud history of developing uh, infrastructure in partnership with the private sector. And many of you may have come in from the airport on CityLink and uh, come across the Balti Bridge. Uh, these uh, very significant pieces of infrastructure done as one of the, the first uh, major PPPs in this country. And uh, you know, we are uh, getting better value for money as a consequence of using these models. Uh, <coughs> uh, one of the, the key PPP innovations applied in Canada is the use of completion payments. And in our early PPPs here in Victoria, we didn't use this approach. However, I think post the GFC, there is an increasing use of modified financing. And our approach has been to make a, a capital contribution to projects where there are liquidity constraints or where there's an opportunity to optimise the amount of risk capital and effectively leverage that lower cost of government borrowing. And this is one of those areas where it's very important for, for governments and, and industry, I think, to get the balance right. Uh, too much government funding, you can say, well, yes, it does, you, you can get your finance at a lower risk by using the government's balance sheet, but it also transfers that risk, uh, in some cases uh, uh, unacceptably, I think, to the government. Uh, you do want to have that uh, tension there. You do need to have the private sector proponents having skin in the game. That is one of the great disciplines of the PPP model that ensures that the taxpayer can be uh, confident there will be value for money delivered at the end of the day. Uh, so we want that commercial discipline that private finance brings to projects and service delivery while maximising value for the public and having the right amount of private sector finance at the right time will help to deliver this. Uh, we also want to maintain the integrity of private disciplines and not for government to necessarily be an equity or debt provider with all the associated risks and conflicts of interest and structural complexity that that leads to. Uh, our approach is very much been to examine on a case-by-case -case basis to assess what is the appropriate balance of criteria such as risk allocation and cost, complexity and the need for innovation and competition and to apply that right set of criteria to a particular project to get the right outcome. Uh, in fact, uh, in a series of reforms that I announced to Victoria's PPP model last year, uh, I've incorporated lessons from project experiences in other jurisdictions, including Canada. 
And one example has been the use of innovative practices such as a scope ladder in tender processes. And uh, to give you one uh, real life example, the Victorian Government is building a new Bendigo Hospital, a $630 million project, uh, very significant. Bendigo is one of our major regional cities and uh, the hospital there had been fairly run down and it was decided that the best way forward is to build uh, a completely new hospital. We had a very competitive bidding process, uh, which is terrific. And I think it does send a message that Victoria is, has a reputation as being a good place to do business. We do have uh, rule of law, we do have uh, a fairly stable economy, we've got a good workforce, and uh, we, do have, uh, we do respect uh, uh, contractual rights. Um, and in relation to this particular project, uh, because we'd effectively allocated a budget for it, we decided that one of the ways in which we could leverage maximum value was to have a scope ladder and determine, well, here are, here are the base things which uh, all bidders must agree to do. But beyond that, if you have additional capacity, here are further, further initiatives that we would like to see as part of this project. So effectively, rather than sort of saying, you bid down to us on the basis of the lowest possible price, we wanted you to bid up to us in terms of uh, the quality of the project and what additional uh, aspects to that project you're able to deliver. And I have to say that from a government's point of view, we were very, very pleased with that outcome. We got uh, what we think will be a stunning, absolutely stunning uh, new hospital for the people of Bendigo and surrounds. Uh, the, uh, the price we think is a fair one uh, and the additional capacity we've been able to generate through that bidding process with the PPP has been something which has been very effective. So this is certainly something that we would look to for appropriate uh, projects in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we've been, uh, we've also learnt the lesson, I think, of listening to the market. And uh, to give you another case study, I'll refer to um, one of the, the largest projects we've got on the go at the moment here in Victoria, and that is stage one of the East-West Link. Now that is a, a significant road project uh, linking up two of our major arterial freeways uh, between the Eastern Freeway and uh, CityLink or the Taylor Marine Freeway. Uh, most of that will be through a tunnel. It will be a large uh, pro project, it will be uh, a relatively expensive project but it is one which has been identified uh, for many years as being absolutely necessary for this state's growth. We need to have our major freeways linked up. Uh, we've got a strong population growth here, 1.8 per cent a year. Uh, for those of you who've been or seen the MCG, uh, one of our great cauldrons of sport here in Victoria, uh, that has a seating capacity of about 100,000. So you imagine a grand AFL grand final day. Uh, last Saturday in September, uh, crowds uh, cheering, a full stadium. That's 100,000 people. That is how many people we, we are getting in net terms to our state every year, uh, partly through natural growth, partly through interstate migration, and partly through overseas migration. So while we welcome, we welcome uh, that population increase and acknowledge it as being a good economic driver for us, we also acknowledge the fact that it does put additional pressure on us in terms of building infrastructure and growing services. So with a growing population, we do need to make sure our transport links uh, keep pace with that demand. So uh, in going to market on our uh, proposed east-west link, we took some soundings first. And in Australia, and I think we're not the lone ranger in this, uh, there had been examples of previous road projects where perhaps pre-GFC, where people were a little bit more bullish in their, uh, in their uh, optimistic assessments of how projects were going to go and getting the deal done was seen as being uh, almost the most important thing. We did see some projects where uh, traffic volumes that had been assessed by bidders simply didn't come to pass. And you could look at the Clem 7 uh, road up in Brisbane, you could look at the Cross City Tunnel in Sydney. And there were cases where traffic projections had been taken on by the private sector didn't come to pass and there was some red ink as a consequence. So in taking market soundings, we heard very clearly the view that for a government 
in the current circumstances to expect uh, companies to take on that traffic volume risk uh, would have led to effectively a significant premium in the bidding costs. And it very quickly became apparent to us that that was not a risk that was worth taking. It was not a risk that was worth paying for as a government. Um, one of the benefits of being a government is having broad shoulders and broad balance sheets. And in Victoria we do have a strong financial position. We've got a budget surplus this year and each year over the next four years. We're the only state in the country with a stable AAA credit rating from both Standard and Poor's and Moody's. And we've worked very hard to secure that financial position. So it does mean uh, our, our, our shoulders and our balance sheet are broad enough to be able to uh, bear uh, risk, if you like, of traffic volumes. So the way we've structured this particular proposal with East West Link is that it is the government that will receive the toll revenue. So to the extent, if you want to call it risk, we will take the risk of uh, the toll revenue being less than we might have thought. But the upside for us is that first of all, the private sector tenderers aren't taking on that risk, so we don't have to build in inflated premiums that they would have charged us for it. But the important thing is that we get the benefit of that toll revenue. And once it is proven up, after a period of opening, after two years or three years or whatever the appropriate period is, we then have a very, very soundly based revenue stream, which can then be taken by the state government and applied to other projects, or uh, monetised, uh, packaged up and sent, uh, paid for in a, in a bidding competition, hopefully a hotly contested one with uh, pension funds and other people who are interested in those sorts of long-term brownfield infrastructure assets. Now I think it's very important that if we want to see innovative methods of financing, if we want to see that infrastructure deficit that a lot of Western economies have start to narrow, we need to be more innovative in our thinking and we need to listen to what the market is telling us in terms of how we can get these projects built and the way in which we get them built. So as a government we are very excited by East West Link. We, we had uh, four international consortia put their hands up initially. We've now uh, got a short list of three and uh, we're very confident that will lead to a process that will give Victorians not only excellent value for money but design innovation that uh, you couldn't necessarily do uh, sitting around a public service department. And uh, that's another thing that I'd, I'd just like to, to briefly touch on, is that the state government is very conscious of the fact that not all wisdom resides in government, and certainly not all innovation or good ideas or entrepreneurship resides in government. So what we have done is open up uh, avenues for unsolicited proposals to come to government. Uh, get that leverage out of good private sector ideas who say, look, we think we've got a good proposal to put to you in relation to a particular government asset or a government service or a way of delivering it or a way of transforming it and making sure that they can go through a process where those proposals can be assessed rationally, objectively and calmly and also assessed in such a way that the intellectual property of the company or person bringing that idea to us is protected. Um, there can be a tension sometimes between uh, the need to have competitive processes and uh, driving tenders which can get you better value for money but on the other hand uh, sometimes the best ideas will never come to you if it does involve particular intellectual property and people don't feel that that process can be adequately respected. So uh, we like, would like to think we've got uh, the balance right We've already had some, uh, the process has only been open for a few weeks, we've already had a number of proposals put to us and uh, many others about to come in. So we think that government working together with the private sector uh, as in a genuine partnership is, is certainly the best way forward. And uh, I would like to say that, that we've been very, very pleased with uh, uh, our, our friends from Canada in terms of their contribution to Victoria and their contribution to our infrastructure. And just to give, uh, to give one example, the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre is a terrific project. It's a $1.2 billion hospital project currently under construction here in Melbourne. And this is a project which has got great Canadian connections uh, with uh, PCL in a building joint venture with the Australian builder Grocon. 
and uh, one of the PPP equity investors is the uh, CDPQ Super Fund. Uh, so we think that there's been some great collaboration between Canada and, uh, and Australia, and particularly Victoria, in relation to PPPs, both at a government level and a private sector level. Uh, it's, it's, it is certainly the case that if the infrastructure deficits that economies and societies like ours currently have are to be, bro are to be broached, we do need to work much harder in getting innovative ways of financing infrastructure to market. We do need to make sure, importantly, that we bring the community with us. They do need to see the value. They do need to understand that uh, the private uh, operation of so-called public infrastructure can lead to better outcomes. And certainly from a Victorian point of view, I think the proof has been in the pudding. Uh, we were very innovative back in the 1990s when, uh, partly through innovation and partly through necessity, the Victorian Government of the day elected to privatise our electricity generation, transmission and distribution assets. Uh, it was a difficult time for the State Government in financial terms, but the way in which that was done generated extraordinary outcomes in terms of the prices that were received for those assets, and importantly, as time has gone on, and I say this as a former Energy Minister, the proof has been in the pudding that Victorian power consumers are better off than their counterparts in other states because, not in spite of, but because of that decision to privatise our generation, transmission, transmission and distribution assets. Uh, they've got better uh, service levels at lower prices compared to those states where that infrastructure remains in state hands. And I think the, the last thing I'd, I'd leave you with, and I'm happy to take questions, is that for those governments, whether they're in Canada or Victoria or Australia, who are considering what assets they have on their books, it's always very important to think about uh, what you could do with the proceeds of privatising an asset. And if the argument is, if you think that you can do better things with the proceeds from the sale of one asset in terms of creating new infrastructure, and that your community will be a net beneficiary of that, you should have the courage to do it. Thanks very much.